A language which has no grammar can express only as many ideas as the number of words, quite like tools which have limited set of charts and don't give you the flexibility to do beyond that. We want to recreate this visual and what would happen if we ignore the principles of encoding and ignore the principles of grammar or graphics. I've taken the same data and went about recreating it using a modern visualization package. So, <laughs> used the pre-built charts and pre-built colors, everything is default because visuals have an easy drag and drop interface. But again, what you automatically create may not be as good as a masterpiece creator. So, we wanted to demonstrate that. Today, we'll be talking about three things. Firstly, I'll introduce the concept of grammar of graphics. Then we will go through a tutorial in terms of how to understand and uh, the specifics of the concept. And finally, we'll look at application of this concept to a real world example, a real world data visualization classic uh, case study. And we'll also do an interesting experiment as to what would happen if one ignores the grammar of graphics. So we'll see how it can either make or break data stories. That will be the uh, final part. With that, let's get started. I wanted to read this sentence and tell me what you make of it. Looks cryptic, clunky, doesn't make much sense. <laughs> Apart from the regular way, I, I kind of imposed some additional constraints for myself. I didn't do it the conventional way. I tried constructing this by using many sentences and this is what uh, it looks like. Whereas if we do the conventional way, this is actually what I tried in May. So this is as simple and concise as it can get. So this is what when this is what happens when you use words and grammar to string together to string together sentences elegantly. Whereas if you use uh, artificial approach and not the natural way, you might end up with something like that. And language has evolved over thousands of years. So we have earliest scripts which were not very different from these. And over thousands of years, it's progressed and now we have something which is much more fluid and elegant. So that way, language today has a very fluid construction. And if we take a quick example of a sentence like this, John hit the ball. There are specific grammatical elements here and each of it has a meaning and the way it's uh, strung together, it conveys overall meaning to the sentence. So if we change any of these, the words, or even alter the sequence of words, it might mean something totally different. For instance, if we just alter the words, the ball hit John, might mean something completely opposite. Right? So, so much for English grammar. But the reason I'm spending time on this is there's an interesting parallel which emerges. All we've seen so far with words and constructing a sentence can also be extended to data. It's, it's uh, exactly the same. So let's look at sample data and see how uh, we can create different representations. So if we take a sample table like this, a small table with sales and growth numbers, what can we do with this table? We can present it by taking growth as the x-axis, sales as the y-axis, and this shows the relationship and this also happens to be the scatter plot. The same table we can present it as growth showing the height and sales showing the width, in which case it ends up being a Marimekko plot, a variant of the bar chart. We can also change this by using sales for the angle and growth for the color, in which case it becomes the donut chart. So we have used different encodings for the same data and the way they are combined together to create a representation has a meaning. Each of it has a different meaning and a, and a representation in terms of significance. Here, the focus is on the biggest slice, which is red. Whereas here, the focus is on the biggest, uh, the, area, the area is the focus here, where you are trying to see which of those regions have high sales and growth. Whereas here, the focus turns to relationship. What is the relationship between sales and growth? So do regions which grow faster also have higher sales, or do you have any anomalies? So that way, you can see how data can be presented differently. And that is the parallel we are going to be talking about. And that is the foundation for grammar of graphics. 
So we have seen sentences are elegant compositions of grammatical elements that convey precise meanings. Similarly, visual visualizations are elegant mapping of data with visual encodings to tell a data story. So we just replaced sentences with visualizations and words and grammatical elements with data. This was put forth by Wilkinson in his book, uh, Grammar of Graphics. It was a seminal book. And uh, this has been the foundation for a lot of packages. The fundamental concept here is that charts are not monolithic entities. So we should not think charts, rather we should think the data, encoding, and the fundamental representational elements. So how do we do that? Wilkinson proposes a seven-layered structure. And he says if we use this structure by combining elements, this is equivalent to the English grammar, and we'll be able to come with elegant visuals. So what do each of these layers mean and how do we use them? We'll see a quick tuto tutorial which covers that. We'll use this data as a sample for this tutorial. It, it has uh, sales from six cities across three regions and shows the price and volume, the volume numbers and the revenue. And for this, we'll be using R and ggplot2 as the package. Um, I think last time we spoke about uh, the earlier session about R and ggplot2. So how many of you are familiar with R? Okay, that's great. Almost half of you. So uh, the, the reason I chose this also is because ggplot2 is fairly powerful, open source, and uh, you can see the popularity here in this room. And also it is built with the grammar of graphics as a foundation. So that way it is uh, the best example that can be taken up here. So we'll start with the first underlying layers, the bottommost layers, data, aesthetics, and geometries. So data here refers to the underlying data that we are going to be bringing into the plot. Aesthetics refers to the visual encodings. It could be size, uh, color, or the axis that we are trying to plot. And when we talk about geometries, it is really the shape, whether it is point, line, or rectangles, what is the shape that we're trying to use to present the data. So these are the underlying layers. If we use a command such as this, ggplot, data, aesthetics, and uh, you say <coughs> geometry would be point. And by the way, those who are not familiar with R, do not worry. In case you don't have a programming background, again, no problem, because all of this that we'll cover in the tutorial will be almost like uh, simple English. So you'll be able to understand it. And I promise you, you'll be able to uh, take home this concept and the, the key takeaways from the session. So we've uh, passed these three elements. We've called the data. And aesthetics, we are mapping price onto the x-axis, sales onto the y-axis. And we're saying we want point as geometries. This creates a plot like this. So this, again, is a scatter plot. And it's just exactly that. And it's almost English-like. So each of these layers have a lot of options um, available. So we, we can bring in colors, sizes, and different geometries like I mentioned. Uh, in this tutorial, we'll look at a couple of examples for each layer, and that will be good represented. So what would be useful now in the earlier plot is we have seen how the cities have uh, are spanning across the sales and uh, the growth. Right? So let's go back here. So you've seen that there are some cities which have low price and have achieved low sales, and then there are others which are on the other extreme and some spread out in between. It will be useful to find out how the regions cluster, because all of these are the underlying cities. How do the three regions cluster? Are they close together or are they spread out? We can do that by introducing region and coloring the points based on region. How do we do that? Again, this also falls into the aesthetics layer. We just add two words saying color equals region. So this again goes into the aesthetic bucket. When we do that, the same plot changes into this. So now we can see that northeast has three points, whereas uh, west is spread out. There's one on the bottom and one on the top, the top right. So this is how this, uh, the regions are clustered. It will be useful if we can also bring in the volume element. So the next question would be, do we have certain cities which are selling at a low price but high volume? So is that the case here? So how do we bring that in? It might be useful to use size as a variable. So we again bring in size into the aesthetic layer and say size equals volume, just uh, calling the specific volume as a variable name. Then the plot changes into this. So now you can see that the points have taken a size, and this is also called as the bubble chart. 
So we have uh, South region with low price, low sales, and low revenue. Whereas you have one city in the West which has high sales, high price, and high revenue. Something which all companies would like to have. So we have seen the three layers so far. And what's also useful in some visualizations is we would, we would want to plot it side by side and see <coughs> what is a good comparison. So for instance, if you're trying to look at the weather pattern in the US, uh, if we were to lay it out, we can use the, uh, the US map color coded and repeat it 12 times, one for each month. That way we will have side by side plots to compare how the weather changes around uh, through the year. So something similar can be done here and that would be the next layer, which is called physics. Physics is nothing but uh, splitting it out into side by side or multiple rows and columns. We can achieve that by saying facet trap by region. And now what happens is the three regions are split out. Instead of having all of this in a single plot, we have individual regions and in some cases it will be useful to see the clustering within that. So this comes in very handy when uh, you're trying to use also a principle called uh, the principle of small multiples where a large chart is broken down into smaller units and you repeat it multiple times to tell how it varies on a particular entity. So you know small multiples by using facets. So far what we have done is we've just represented the data as is. But often in practice, we would have to do some computations on data. It would be as simple as counting, doing some summations, or uh, even more uh, statistical computations like mean, uh, standard deviation, and so on. So either you have to do this separately in a table and then bring it in, or you could do it dynamically as well. And this layer, which is layer 5, statistics, <coughs> brings that element in. And ggplot2 lets you do it dynamically. You don't have to do it separately. So you just have to add this uh, stat summary. And here we are trying to do an average by uh, each price point. The intent here is we, we are trying to see, instead of looking at all the cities, we want to see what are the unique price points for the entire country. <coughs> and how do the sales vary by the price point, irrespective of the cities. That's what we are trying to achieve here. So now you see that there are four bars. And how did, how did we achieve the bars? We've changed geometry from point to bar. So now it becomes a bar chart. So we see that there are four unique price points and almost looks sorted. <coughs> Dummy data. So, so this is a way that you can switch representations, bring in newer elements, and statistics uh, can be very, very useful. Layer 6 is coordinates. So far, we've been plotting everything in uh, XY coordinate, which is also called Cartesian coordinate. At times, it will be useful to uh, change this into a circular plot, say something uh, like a polar coordinates. What would happen to our data if we switch from Cartesian to polar coordinates? We just have to add uh, this word, saying polar coordinates polar, and it transforms our plot into this. So we saw this three side by side, it again changes into this. And now you can see uh, the, the circular plot for each of the three regions. And you may, uh, people who are familiar with visuals might also notice that this is similar to the radar plot or the spider chart. Right? So that again is on a, co a polar coordinates. And for our data, we see that this is not very useful. So uh, we would want to go back to a Cartesian coordinate. So let's revert it back to the Cartesian coordinates. How do we do it? We just remove this command, and by default, ggplot uh, takes there's no mention and take it as a Cartesian coordinate. So we've seen six layers, and all of these are representations of data or some transformations. What is also very important is to look at non-data ink. So what, what do we mean by non-data ink? It could be the chart title, the access title, or uh, stuff like uh, the background colors, and all of these other elements and narratives. So Lee spoke about data stories. So data stories need copious text around it, charts alone will not do. So that's where you bring in the theme into the picture. And that's what the seventh layer is about. So as a simple example, we're just uh, changing the background color of the plot from uh, the gray scale. We have seen that as a background gray. From there, we are changing it into a black and white uh, theme. So when we add this, it changes the plot into this. It looks much cleaner. So we can see that the background theme has changed. So these are the seven layers of the grammar of graphics. We've looked at a couple of examples for each. And 
just to summarize what each of it means, data is where we bring in the actual variables. Aesthetics is where we have the scales like the size, the color, axis. And geometries is where we bring in the shapes, points, um, lines, and so on. Facets is, is where we have the rows and columns, side-by-side -side plots. Statistics is where we're doing the computation on the data, coordinates of the plotting space. And finally, theme describes all the non-data ink. So, so far, so good. Now, having learned this, we'll have to apply this somewhere. So, I've taken an example of a classic visualization, and let's see how it's been applied, how, how this concept has been applied there, though this visualization is much older. So how many of you are familiar with um, Napoleon's <laughs> march? Yes. Okay, again, how many of you? Great. So um, this is the data that uh, Charles Minard has used. And for, for those of you who are not familiar with it, I'll be showing the visualization, I'll, I'll explain that. But uh, a quick background, this visualization is about 150 years old and hand-drawn visualization, which effectively summarizes the disastrous campaign of uh, invasion of Russia by Napoleon. And uh, a lot of visualization experts still consider this as one of the best visuals ever created. And if you look at the data underlying that, it's just these three tables which fits into one slide, not even a spreadsheet of data. So almost similar to uh, the data we saw earlier. Right? So with this, if we say this, someone has created a visualization, a historic visualization, which has survived hundreds of years of discussions. It looks surprising. So this is the visualization. Let me quickly walk you through the story. So Napoleon, in an audacious campaign, he started with almost half a million soldiers from here on this uh, point in the map, and he started marching inwards. And the intent was to capture Moscow. So after many months of march and struggle, he, the army eventually penetrated deep into Russia, and finally did manage to reach Moscow. So at that point, he had about 100,000 soldiers left, but they had actually captured Moscow. But what happened was the Russians burnt the city and retreated further in inwards. So there was really nothing to capture. So they waited there for a few months, and realizing the futility, they started retreating back from Russia. So that's uh, the black shaded portions you're seeing. That's the army on the retreat. And as they started retreating, that's when the Russians started really attacking them. So a lot of scam skirmishes, battles, and uh, steady loss of soldiers there. And that's also the time of the year the winter was setting in. And the Russian winter was extremely severe. And it's said that the Russian winter killed more soldiers than even the war. So uh, it was a miracle that Napoleon managed to get out of Russia alive with just about 10,000 soldiers here. It started with about half a million. So this is the campaign summarized in a visual and you saw the data there. So uh, this is the mastery of the, the person creating it, where he's blended all these elements together and created a masterpiece. So here, if we go back to our uh, grammar of graphics, how are the seven layers used here? So I'd be happy if you're able to fill in. Uh, let me tell the first layer, data, which is pretty obvious. So we have the actual data showing the, uh, the soldier count, the temperatures, and the locations. That's number one, layer one, okay, done with that. So layer two is the aesthetics. So what do you think are the aesthetic elements which come in here? The color. So we saw that color is one of the aesthetic elements. So you have two colors, one for the forward march and one for the retreat. So you have two colors. And we also have size. Size we saw that is part of the aesthetics. We have size of the army shown by the thickness of the lines. So that's again another element. And we have this on again on an XY Cartesian coordinate plotted on a map. So it's again X and Y. So that is layer two. Right. What's so the also the distances? We also have the distances. <coughs> yes, uh, the length. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. yeah. That's again there. Uh, what's layer three? Layer three is the geometry. What is the geometry being used here? Line. Line. Yeah. Right. So it's all along lines, and the lines are uh, taking different thickness at different points. And here again, you have a line chart for the temperature. So that's layer three. Layer four, faceting. Are we doing faceting here? No, there's no faceting here. Layer five is the statistics. Uh, what are the statistics aspect coming in? 
the totals of the soldiers. At different points, you have the army splitting, joining back. Uh, the totals are just being done here. That, that's the statistics. Layer 6 is the coordinate. We've seen that it is Cartesian coordinate. And layer 7 is the theme. So there's copious use of uh, labels of places, rivers, and other map elements. And in the actual visual which uh, uh, Minard created, there was a narrative. So there, were, there, was a few, there was a few lines of summary which beautifully captured the essence of the visual. So that also falls into layer 7, which is a theme, non-data aim. So uh, this is how um, the seven layers of the visual, uh, seven layers of grammar of graphics are coming into a, a visualization like this. And if you go back and look at any good visualization, they would have used this well. And in addition to this, the other missing piece here is the encoding. So how do you encode data onto the right visual attributes? So there, there again, there is cognitive science behind that, maybe for some other session. But a combination of encoding and grammar of graphics lends a uh, true power to any visualization. So uh, before we wrap up, I told you about this experiment. Right? So we want to recreate this visual. And what would happen if we ignore the principles of encoding and ignore the principles of grammar of graphics? So uh, what I've done here is I've taken the same data and went about recreating it using a modern visualization package. So I picked one of those popular packages and just fed in this data, used the pre-built charts and pre-built colors. Everything is default because visuals have an easy drag and drop interface. But again, what you automatically create may not be as good as a masterpiece creator. So we wanted to demonstrate that. So I used a Tableau public for this. Again, full disclaimer, nothing wrong with the tool. <laughs> Everything is about the technique and the skill of the person creating it. So there are equally great and equally worse visualizations which are which can be created in every tool uh, that we can lay our hands on. So with that, if we create a visualization, and uh, that's how it would look like. So like a operate KPA dashboard, we have the KPAs at the top, soldier loss, and you have 400 plus thousand soldiers lost. The percentage is 97 percentage. 47 battles, temperature top is 30. And this is the path taken, or rather the, the locations um, you have in the map. And you would notice that there was a forward count and a reverse count. So by default, when you feed certain columns, the visuals say, hey, do you want to create this chart? So typically, it might be a bar, a bar chart or a scatter plot. So we've created one for the forward march. This shows how the, the soldiers count reduces and this is a reverse march again <coughs> not comparable scales you don't get anything out of it and this is the temperature this is another table so insert another chart into it you get that and now finally what you do you pick all of these charts and put it together into one dashboard and say this is my data story yeah. <laughs> so uh, we work with a lot of organizations and when uh, when i talk to people uh, i see that this has almost become like a factory model so there is data being pumped in from warehouses and from various sources and people have to churn out 10 reports, 20 reports in a day. And people are, people don't have the background, they don't have the context, and maybe not given the training. And without uh, realizing the importance of visualization, they just churn out report after report. So organizations typically have 400, 500 reports. And when it's done without the base, each report would be something like this. Whereas, uh, just to compare, this is how we've create, taken this visual and kind of deconstructed <laughs> into what we see on the bottom right. And this is the risk that anyone who doesn't go through the basics uh, stands uh, as getting into. So with this, I just want to wrap up. Uh, the seven layers of uh, grammar of graphics are paramount. And please do not think in terms of preset charts in any tool. Uh, a, a tool might come with 15 or 20 charts. Do not get restricted by that. Look at the data, look at the encoding, and see how you can create. And that's when you will be able to create your own charts, invent your own charts. I mentioned that all of these, many of these charts do not have names. When you combine uh, x, y, and bring in a, a rectangle or bring it into a polar coordinates, many of these may not have names. What is important is, does it make sense for your data? Will users be able to read it? If that, uh, these two conditions are satisfied, by all means, go for it. And you can name your chart and publish it. So I want to leave you with this quote, uh, again from Wilkinson, <coughs> where he says that a language which has no grammar can express only as many ideas as the number of words, quite like tools which have 
limited set of charts and don't give you the flexibility to do beyond that. Thank you.